able to be together with you physically here and for those who are joining us from home. Uh, karibu sana to our Sunday school hour here at Trinity Baptist Church. If you don't, if you've not met or you're new to us, my name is Eric Abuao and privileged, God willing, over the next four Sundays to be uh, teaching during the Sunday school hour. Uh, specifically on this area that uh, uh, focuses on the name, one of the names of God, the name of our God, Elkanah, the God whose name is Jealous. I trust that during this time, the Lord would help us to see the privilege we find in God's gift of self-disclosure as the God whose name is Jealous. And hopefully we'll also see the, the poverty we suffer from when we fail to know God as he has revealed himself in this way. Perhaps the risks that, uh, that accompany ignorance in uh, such an area as, as this. We will look at the implications of God being one who has called his, himself jealous with regards to his own glory, his relationship with you as a person, and his relationship with others. He has called you to, in one way or another, perhaps has called you to them as a preacher. And so when you're preaching the gospel, how does that reality or knowledge of the fact that God is jealous influence how you preach the gospel to those whom God has called you to? Or your family members at home, how do you relate with them when you know that God is jealous? Um, and such things. But before we go on further, may I kindly request that we ask God for help. Oh Lord, we come to you this morning, and we do so with much thanksgiving. You have, throughout this year, enabled us, in spite of the pandemic, to have Sunday school teachings going on, whether it was teaching as I'm doing now, or table talk, or a panel discussion, you have allowed us not to suffer want with regards to the, the availability of your word during this hour for the salvation of souls and the strengthening of those who are saved. We please pray that you'd once more be with us as we now um, go through the month of December and the Sunday school sessions in this month. Please help me, help those who'd be listening and participating to think your thoughts after you and to seek to glorify your name in what we think, say, and do. Reveal yourself to us, O oh great God. May we know you in your beauty as Elkanah. We please ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I'm going to do some introduction uh, before we uh, dive proper into God's name, the name Jealous, as is revealed in Scripture. I want us to do some preliminary discussion on why it is important to, to know God. Why study God? Why, why spend time discussing who God is when there may be seemingly other screaming things at this time? Why not talk about other things in, in our space right now that seem to be really screaming for attention. We will look at that uh, today, 
but before we do that, I would like to go through, may I please take the clicker, a number of verses that talk to us about the fact that God, this is not, especially when we talk about jealous, this is, this is, this for us is a vice. How do you ascribe that to, to God who is holy? Whenever we think about jealousy, we think about uh, Shakespeare's green-eyed monster. It's, it's not something we think of in terms of virtue. So we are going to look at it a bit more. But for now, let's look at texts in Scripture that uh, indeed demonstrate that God says of himself that he is jealous. Exodus 20 verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. What's happening there? What's happening in Exodus 25? What's the context? Perhaps that's the proper question I should be asked. The Ten Commandments. Thank you, Pastor Murungi. It is the Ten Commandments. Which commandment is this? All right, homework. <laughs> All right, homework, isn't it? Are you interested in knowing? Let me not give it to you on a silver platter. So that's homework. And then Exodus 34, 14, right after he had told them this, and they had heard him clearly, they fashioned a God. They bowed down to the uh, golden calf. And uh, God then tells them this, as that's now the context in Exodus 34, 14, before the giving out of the second tablets after the first ones had been broken. You, for you shall not worship, you, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. So God himself says his name is, is jealous. Then look at others. Uh, Deuteronomy 4.24 For the Lord your God is a consuming fire a jealous God Deuteronomy 5.9 You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Deuteronomy 32, 16. They stirred him to jealousy with strange gods. So God had told them, don't worship false gods, idols, but they still stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations they provoked him to anger. Then see again Deuteronomy 6, 14 and 15. So 14 gives you the context. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. Then the reason is given. For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. And see Joshua 24. The context in Joshua 24, 19 is the people are saying, we are going to serve God, and we are going to serve him alone. And then Joshua tells them, that Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve Yahweh. You are not able to serve the Lord. 
for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. And when we read this, you flee to Christ because we are no different. Our best of resolves to serve God will be met by what Joshua is saying there in Joshua 24.19. You can't serve God. And why can't you serve God? It's not because you won't put in efforts, but your righteous deeds would still be filthy rags before him. What he expects of you is so high, you can't meet it on your own. You flee to Christ. He says you are not able to serve Yahweh. He is holy. He is Hannah. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions. Psalm 79, 5. How long, O oh Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Psalmist cries out. Psalm 78, 58. For they provoked him to anger with their high places. They moved him to jealousy with their idols. And look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19. This is the context, verse 18. Verse 18 says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Then Paul asks the question, do you, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? who is within whom you, have, whom you have from God. You are not your own. Sorry, I didn't put verse 20. Let me go to verse 20. I'm sorry for that. Sorry, I picked, I picked the wrong text there. Give me for that. And then Second Corinthians eleven two I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. We've seen that scripture does talk about God being jealous as an attribute a number of places. But as I've said at the start, maybe we need to pull back and ask ourselves, is it necessary to study the subject of God? Why should we study the subject of God? A.W. Toza said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Worship is pure or base, poor, as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts of God. For this reason, the gravest question before the church is always God himself. The most potentious facts about any man is not what he at a given time may say or do, but what he in his deep heart conceives God to be like. We tend by a secret law of the soul to move towards our mental image of God. This is true not only of the individual Christian but of the company of Christians that composes the church. In other words, it's not just true about you as an individual, but of us as a body corporate. What we secretly think about God will be seen in how we conduct ourselves. Then always the most revealing thing about the church is her idea of God, just as her most significant message is what she says about him or lives and said, for her silence is often more eloquent than her speech. 
and that's A.W. Tozer in the small book, The Knowledge of the Holy. But let me engage you here. Why should we study this subject? Why should we spend time? Uh, sorry, you can blank that first. What texts of scripture would motivate you to want to study God? Yes, yes, Brother Paul, I don't know if, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. I would say Romans 1, 18. Romans 1. It says that uh, man is sinful and because of his sinful, he suppresses the knowledge of God. So if there is that tendency in man, then it's important for us to want to know God as he has revealed himself. Okay. Wow. Okay, so my tendency to suppress. And truth. About God. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yes, yes, Brother Louis here. I'm I'm thinking of First Corinthians ten thirty one. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you do all to the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And the first question of catechism, uh, what's the ch chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God mm. and to enjoy him forever so mm. that necessitates studying God. Thank you. First Corinthians 10, 31. I got that right. Yeah. Any other thoughts? What, what, what makes you want to study this subject, the subject of God? I, I start here because why is usually a very important question. If I just came here and told you about the subject of God before bringing us to a place where we appreciate the importance of the subject, you will not profit from it as you ordinarily would have if you understand why this is crucial. Is this just some optional extra for a Christian? Is this a subject for theological knuckleheads? Or is it for every Christian? Why, why study the subject of God? Yes, yes, uh, Brother James. Thank you, Ken. Okay. Try and think about what would motivate you from God's word. Uh, I, must, I say that uh, our desire for deep intimacy with God uh, makes us more to want to know more about him uh, mm. uh, so that we can have a close affection and intimacy with him so we have to have the knowledge of God. Okay, any text that comes to mind? Deuteronomy 6, 4. Uh, okay, Deuteronomy 6, 4, and Pastor Murungi also adds Philippians 6, 10. Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And then Philippians, Philippians 3, 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. 
So there is a biblical uh, call and example in the Apostle Paul of that kind of pursuit of communion with God. Okay, yes, Brother Harvey. Uh, just to add, uh, I think uh, it's necessary to study God so as to truly understand uh, life in general. Why, why there's suffering? Mm. Why, uh, why would, why we say God is holy? Mm. Uh, uh, amidst all all that, uh, the confusion that there is, um, we could get immersed in, in the ideas of the world, but mm -hmm. uh, of what the world thinks God to be. So I think what the Bible says, okay. what God says of himself. Okay, for wisdom and understanding, and we'll see that in a short while. Let me walk you through what I proposed would be uh, a reason for uh, spending time on this subject. You see that studying the subject of God gives us a platform for a proper solution to our desire for God as Christians. You remember Moses desires more of God and he says, "You, Lord, show me your glory. There in Exodus 33, 18 and it's uh, what Pastor Murungi and Brother Mirigi are saying for purposes of close communion with the Lord. When we are at that place where we say, oh, that I may know you, that I may walk at a deeper depth with you, that I may be known by you. You know, that yada, knowing, not just proposition or knowing, but experiential life knowing of God that affects you every moment of your life, constantly able to, to be aware of him. And you, you're asking God, oh Lord, help me throughout this day to be aware of the fact that you're omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient. And whatever little do thing I'm doing, whether it's important uh, in, in my estimation or or mundane. So it's a practical solution for uh, our desire for the knowledge of God. I think you've gone to one of the last slides. I'm not so sure. Yes, that's, the, that's where we are supposed to do to be. And then secondly, uh, what Brother Harvey is saying, it's a practical way to meet our need for wisdom. The wisdom of God as we go through life. Look at what Proverbs 9, 10 says. And here I'm going to invite you to, again, help me deal with the parallelism here. Rather, to, deal, to, 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 to you know, just understand this proverb by looking at the parallels. So this is a practical way. Studying this subject is a practical way for you, for me, for us to meet our need for the wisdom of God as we go through life. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is a beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So what things are paralleled there? I believe there are people in the room who would be able to help me here. What is paralleled in that proverb? Yes, yes, Brother Martin. Fear in God and wisdom. Fear in God and wisdom. So fear is paralleled to, to what? To wisdom. Mm, no. I think wisdom is paralleled to insight. Good try, though. Isn't it? Because what parallelism is, right? <laughs> Anyone would help me explain what parallelism is? Paul is here. Thank you, though, Brother Martin. You, you have a concept of it. Maybe Brother Paul would help us. Uh, yeah, I would say parallelism is 
a kind of way of putting, saying the same thing, mm -hmm. uh, but in in two different ways. Okay. So when there he says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, mm -hmm. and the knowledge of the Holy is in is insight, mm -hmm. he's saying that to fear the Lord is the same as having knowledge of the Holy, because wisdom and insight are the same thing. Mm -hmm. So he's saying you grow in your fear of the Lord mm -hmm. by gaining knowledge of the Holy One. Okay. And that brings you wisdom or All insight. All right. So parallelism is is a, a poetic device, would I call it that? And uh, we do know in our context, many of the times the, the poetic device we mostly use is rhyming, isn't it? But in the Hebrew way of poetry, parallelism is used so that you, you can say the first line by repeating it in the second line, or you can say it better by contrasting, saying the very opposite in the, in the second line. And so you'd see it's used in the book of Proverbs and a number of other poetic books. But here, the fear of the Lord is being compared to the knowledge of the Holy One. Definitely, Lord in the first line is being compared to Holy One, and then wisdom is being compared to insight. So it is important to delve into this subject because it's going to help us to be on that proper path of being wise people, people who have understanding, people who have insight. If we want to be those who are wise, then we need to know the holies or the holy one or Yahweh. So this then becomes an important subject. The next slide. If you have something you'd like to say, please feel free to just uh, indicate, then the microphone will come your way. I think thirdly, it gives us the ability to know the high blessing of properly boasting. Oh, we boast of a fluff. We boast over things that don't amount to in importance to a hill of beans because we've really not gotten to know God. But if we spend time on this subject, look at Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24. Scripture says, But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. But in these things I delight, declares the Lord. So God is saying, you want to boast? Boast about this, that you understand and know me. And you know me with regards to, he says, steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. These things I delight. That's a good motivation to study. I want to study this subject so that I may do have this privilege of boasting properly, not boasting about uh, Achievements that look so high because we are comparing those achievements with what other human beings have done. When we get to see whom God is, we get to that place where, like Paul, we say, in spite of so much achievement, we count them as dumb, as manure, so that we continue to press on towards the excellency of whom our God is. The next slide. I think another reason why it's important to study this subject is it gives us a foundation, an important foundation for crucial faith in God. Crucial faith in God. Why do I use the word crucial? Let's read Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, it is impossible. Not 
difficult, not improbable. The word here is cannot. It is impossible. The word is not, it is unlikely. The word there is not, it would be challenging or a very high task. It just says you cannot please God without faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So there are three things there that uh, studying the subject of God would help us to do. would help us, number one, to know that uh, God exists. It would help us to know that God is faithful. He rewards. And it would help us to know God is good. And those things are so crucial in us having faith in God. He exists. He is good, he rewards, he's faithful. So as we study the subject, that would be one of the privileges we will get. We'll get the privilege of having that absolutely crucial faith in God. Because the opposite of this is, is the opposite of pleasing God is being frowned at by him. It's not indifference. So without faith, you will not just meet a God who is indifferent, you will meet a God who frowns at you. Instead of commending you like Enoch in that context, he'll condemn you. And so you need, you need faith. It's not something that is the reserve of a few people who want to ascend to the high levels of Christian faith. This is for anyone. This subject is for anyone who wants to please God. And that you've come to church makes me believe that you're here for that reason. Come to church because I want to please God. Because you want to please God, then studying the subject of God becomes necessary. Again, I say this is not for a few people. Uh, it's for all of us. Finally, eternal life consists in knowing the only true God. John 17.3 And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life consists in knowing the only true God. Knowing him in terms of knowing him propositionally, in, form, in terms of information, but knowing him also in terms of experience. And knowing him, the Father, the only true God, through the mediatory work of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has clearly said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the way and the truth and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And eternal life, dear friends, is very different from just eternal existence. Because this is not something that will be given to a few and then the rest will be annihilated at death. Okay? We have souls that will never die. And all of us at the resurrection will be given bodies that will never die. And some would spend with those bodies eternity in the presence of God. They live endlessly in the presence of God and that is called eternal life. The others who are not in Christ, would live endlessly 
with their never dying bodies and never dying souls away from the presence of God, and that is called hell. So it is important for us to study this subject because eternal life consists in knowing the only true God. Any comments up to there? Yes, please, please get Pastor Murungi. Thank you. Mm. I wish to, I wish to have one more thing yes. as a, a necessity. Yes. Studying the subject of God. Yes. And this is what uh, Daniel says. Um, in Daniel eleven thirty two. Yes. Uh, we have the context hmm. of um, um, the opposition mm -hmm. that God's people are constantly faced with mm -hmm. uh, from from Satan. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are told that uh, he shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, mm -hmm. but the people who know their God shall stand firm mm -hmm. and take uh, action. Mm -hmm. uh, it is it is necessary to know our God for mm -hmm. us to be able to resist the schemes of the evil one. Amen. And uh, this is further um, emphasized by Paul in uh, Ephesians 6. Mm -hmm from verse 10, that we do not wrestle against flesh, flesh and blood. And uh, the, 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 the armor given mm -hmm. is the armor of God, right. whom we need to know well right. enough, right. Uh, so that uh, we would be able to resist and stand firm. Yes. yes. We have a foe. We have an enemy whose intention is the damnation of your soul. And uh, the weapons of our warfare will only be as mighty as our strength in this area. If we are anemic in our knowledge of God, then we fail to know this privilege found in Daniel 11.32. They that know their God would grow strong, would stand firm, and would act to do exploits. Um, yeah. That's important. Any other? Thank you. Thanks a lot, Pastor Murungi. Any other thoughts on why? It's, it's important that we, we, we start from here so that as we wrestle with uh, the subject, we are willing to sweat and, uh, and have a discourse, even be able to say, I'm struggling with what you're saying. Please don't be in a rush because... I see the importance of me understanding. Don't, don't leave me behind. I appreciate that this is such an important thing that if I'm not understanding, I won't pretend to be okay. I know this is something crucial for me. Which of those is not important for you? Surely, you want to commune with God. You want to be wise and having understanding and insight as you go through life? You want to worship God, or do you want to boast in idols and things that are fluff, that will all be burnt? You want to have the crucial faith that is necessary for receiving that commendation from God, a commendation that, if it's missing, would bring you to condemnation, you want eternal life, you don't want to find yourself suppressing the truth in ignorance, you don't want to find yourself failing to live a life that is glorifying God and enjoying Him forever. You, we've already talked about communion, we've talked about understanding, and you want to grow in your sanctification by continuously putting to death the deeds of the flesh, putting off, putting on the things that Pastor Murungi uh, beseeched us to do, exhorted us to do these uh, past few weeks, are things that we do well when we are students of this necessary subject. Yes, yes, Brother Paul. Uh, 
I don't know. I, I've just remembered when you were being taught in the TPC mm-hmm. on the gospel, uh, mm-hmm. on evangelism, mm-hmm. I just thought uh, uh, Molimu emphasized on needing to know the key things about the gospel. Mm-hmm. And he said that you need to have a right doctrine of God mm-hmm. in order for you to understand the gospel, mm-hmm. why the gospel is important. Mm. And so I was just thinking now that it's necessary for evangelism. It is. Because people have a wrong view of God and that leads them to have a wrong view of themselves right. and of their need. Right. So if you can't explain to another person what the hope that you have mm-hmm. or the God that you know, mm-hmm. uh, then you won't be able to plead with them yes. to repent. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you, Brother Paul. And maybe while you're still having the microphone, if you're able to add something or someone else, what, what would we see in an evangelistic effort where this subject has not been well understood? If I am preaching the gospel and I have not properly understood the doctrine of God, what are some of the things you would see or that we are seeing in evangelistic efforts. They may be well-meaning, they may be sincere, but yet terribly wrong, even sinful. What are some of the things we are seeing in evangelism today? Yes, 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 uh, Ken. Yeah, um, I think this by the, the way the, uh, evangelism is done, by you are being told to do your good work, are the ones which will make you right before God. Mm-hmm. Um, other examples are being told that you choose Christ mm-hmm. and religion. Mm-hmm. There are so many, like those are just bits and examples of not knowing mm-hmm. what the true gospel is. Mm-hmm. So this one identifying that you lay the trust in Christ, mm-hmm. that it is Christ's righteousness, not your own. Right. And it is Him who comes to save. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, uh, Paul and then Aluvisia. Yeah, I think I would say that one thing that I have consistently seen is that there has been this overemphasis on God as a loving grandfather that people do not comprehend that God has been offended by sin, that mm. his holiness is offended by our sin. And so you'll find people saying, I remember... Uh, I was trying to speak to somebody and he was telling me that you can't blame the Indian who is born in idolatry Mm. for their sin. Mm. Uh, God has to make a way for that person Mm. if they never hear of Christ. And that person sincerely believes that. And so that's where the problem is. We Mm. do not know, people do not appreciate God, God's attribute in their entirety. Mm -hmm. And that therefore lessens, because I could see in that person, it lessened his, the need for Christ to die, the need for a person to put their trust in him. Right. But it all began with their view, a wrong view of God. Right. right. Yeah. Um, yes, Brother Lovisia, thank you. For the I, I wanted to say that one on the holiness of God, mm-hmm. and I could just add the Lord omnipotent. So mm-hmm. if we don't understand that, come to know that the Lord is Mm all-powerful, then we know that he can save. He has ordered us what to do, Uh but we don't, it's not our efforts, it's Mm -hmm. not our power that Mm -hmm. save, it's not how loud or how, yet Mm -hmm. we do these efforts, the right understanding of that Mm -hmm. attribute of God Mm -hmm. influence our evangelism. Yes, decisionalism. And manipulating people to come down the aisle with eyes closed, with soft music playing, and manipulating them as if God needs the preacher in order to save people. You're so right, Brother Luvisia. Uh, uh, Harvey and uh, Brother Martin have something to say, which could be the two things we hear about, and then we move on. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the worst I've seen uh, during evangelism is mm. that God is made into a choice which we can either waver or choose to 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 bow to. Mm. That God is one of the many options. Mm. Uh, if uh, an, 
the Muslim God or the Indian God mm-hmm. is uh, is one of the many uh, choices mm-hmm. that uh, God is not that crucial. Mm-hmm. Uh, so his need, his the need for for Jesus Christ is diminished in that even the atheist uh, can still see heaven without Christ, mm-hmm. uh, as long as they sincerely believe in what they believe. Right. Yeah. Unitarianism and uh, ecumenical circles where, uh, and I'm glad a number of churches are now beginning to say the fair breakfast that has been there is, is, is not adding up. It's not making sense for Christian to, to be there, to listen to prayers being made to an idol then we pray in ways that accommodate such prayers and don't offend. I'm, I'm thankful that people are beginning to open up to the reality of this, this prayer breakfast. We appreciate the intention, but the Christian faith cannot accept it. They just, yeah. Brother Martin, you could. Uh, just to echo what Alvis and Paul said, that in evangelism mm. uh, nowadays, the holiness of God is not there. It's not there. Yes. And evangelism begins with the yes, person. The person. Yeah. God and loves you, yes, and he has a good plan for, for you. you. Yeah. Well, the reality is God has a terrible plan for the sinner. Yeah. yeah. So, so if you can see how God revealed himself to Isaiah, Mm-hmm. It was his holiness first, mm-hmm. then his sinfulness. Right. That's when right. he saw right. the need right. Right. that uh, he needs a yes. savior. Yes. Yeah, and that's what that's that, that's where nowadays the gospel today is uh, mm-hmm. is not on that. It's just mm-hmm. as you mentioned. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think, Brother Martin, and all of us, we could even preach about the goodness of God in a way that it helps people to tremble about the holiness of God. For isn't that what we see with Peter? When the Lord helped him to catch a huge hole of fish, he also has an Isaiah 6 moment. Let's depart from me. I am a sinner. I, I, I can't be in your presence. And yet, it was in a context of seeing the goodness of God, and yet it causes him to realize that God is holy. We are saying this subject is necessary, but let's ask ourselves another question. How do we know God? I'm asking that because if you know anything, Whatever little you, you've known from God's word about this subject, hopefully you do appreciate that the God whom we seek to know is incomprehensible. Isn't it? So we are saying we need to know one who is incomprehensible. Are we, are we speaking from both sides of our mouth here? Uh, Christianity is committed simultaneously committed to the knowability of God and the incomprehensibility of God. It's not either or. So Christians believe God is incomprehensible, but they also do believe God can be known. Okay? So it is essential for us to utter the paradoxes we know the incomprehensible God. Or that the incomprehensible God has revealed himself. Isn't it? Sounds it's a paradox. It sounds a paradox. We know the incomprehensible God or the incomprehensible God has revealed himself. We, we are those who are committed to both. And there is a, a chart I have on the next page that hopefully deals with a lot of the challenges around this concern of the incomprehensibility of God. If God is incomprehensible, 
then at the very least, the first thing we would say is we cannot know him unless he discloses himself to us, isn't it? You cannot sit down somewhere, close your eyes, and then hammer in the anvil of your mind a picture that would help you to know God. The knowledge of God is a gift. It is a gift. It is a gift that has been given generally to all and specifically to some. Can any one of you help me to explain what I've said there? This gift of self-disclosure has generally been given to all and specifically been given to some. Maybe yeah. I may try. <laughs> yes. Uh, as I think a few weeks ago we were taught from Romans. Thank you. I was hoping you'd remember that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that God uh, revealed himself to each and every person mm. through uh, what he has created mm -hmm. so that all that is created and all that you are able to perceive do portray the glory of God in the sense of his eternal power mm -hmm. and his divine nature mm -hmm. so that no one is without excuse. Thank you, brother. And maybe if I may add, I'm not mm. sure if it might be true. Also, the the work of his hand, the work of his law, mm -hmm. is imprinted in each and every heart of human being. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. uh, uh, general knowledge. Yes, yes, and Pastor Murungi is approaching that in a few in a few weeks, God willing. But yes, yes, yes Brother Martin. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, was, I wanted to ask that question to point us back to the sermon Pastor Murungi had, but I thought if I asked it referring to that, there could be tension, and in the tension we forget. But thank you. Yes. I think Psalm, Psalm, Psalm 19. Psalm 19, yeah. The, the first six verses is the general revelation of God. Good. Then from verse 7 to 11. Maybe we turn to Psalm 19. Nineteen, you're saying the first six verses a general revelation. And then okay. from verse seven, mm -hmm. it's now the specific revelation. Okay, so do we read through Psalm nineteen? I think we can. The heavens declare the glory of the God of, of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, no other words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and uh, there is nothing hidden from its heat. So there in general revelation, everyone has a privilege of that knowledge. Then notice from verse 7, special revelation. The so general revelation in creation, then special revelation. Now you'll begin seeing the law. The law of the Lord is perfect. And then begin noticing this. Whereas in general revelation, we don't have specific benefits attached when it comes to special revelation, it says something about the law, then there is a benefit. The law of the Lord is perfect. And what does it do? Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and they unrighteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, and drippings of the honeycomb. It goes on. So we do see there is 
general revelation and then there is special revelation in the law and the benefits are here attached to the benefits to the soul are attached to special revelation so it is god who reveals himself to man and that's why i have an arrow little arrows coming down so in 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 this place in this diagram basically uh, i'm saying there are two beings and there are two types of knowledge so there is god and everything else that is created so god is infinite and he is uncreated man is finite and he is created god has infinite and uncreated knowledge man has finite and created knowledge and in between them there is a line a line between time and eternity a line between the finite and the infinite this may look simple but the implications are huge today they are so huge when you think about liberalism when you think about people who imagine that a knowledge of god can have the arrow turned so that it moves from man looking at nature and then developing a knowledge of god whatever knowledge we have of god because of that chasm between the infinite and the finite has to be i'll use two words that hopefully has to be accommodated and it comes to us by means of analogies na logical it has to be accommodated to us in other words god in allowing us to know him will do baby talk have you done baby talk yes we do baby talk and the child is able to understand and you break your english into terrible grammatical errors so that the child is able to understand what you are saying isn't it so god accommodates himself to us and that's what um uh brother victor was saying his eternal nature he he tries to communicate that and communicates that to us in an accommodated way by uh by creation okay various various mediatory platforms creation his word and then analogies so he he will use negative analogies for example god is not man that he should lie isn't it and then he will use positive analogies like a father like a mother and so he accommodates himself to us so that the incomprehensible god becomes comprehensible and this necessitates a turning to his word whenever we want we realize this is important this uh, this reasons for studying the subject as a crucial to us but we will not be able to learn god by imagining whom he is we cannot just decide we we are so committed to the benefits of knowing god that we are going to retreat somewhere in a monastery and imagine and and think and look at creation and determine who god is no it's god who accommodates himself to us it's not rationalism it's not emotionalism it's analogy and our knowledge of him is not uh, equal to his knowledge of himself it's not it's analogy it's not equal it's not equilogical it's analogical any question 
before we end for today. And then now next week, God willing, we delve proper and we come with rolled up sleeves because all of us know this is an important subject. Any comment? Yes, uh, Victor, then uh, Harvey, or, or, and then James. Make it brief so that we can then transition to the next uh, activities. Uh, maybe you could help me because I've been wondering, in the Constitution, we have the freedom of, I think it's religion. Mm. And maybe as a, as a president, when when call forth for prayers, so every form of prayer is brought about. How do you go about the, such a thought? Because it mixes me up. Okay. Yeah. I could bring it closer home when uh, the NCCK, and I'm saying this and it's going public, but it's a thing we are committed to. If the NCCK invited us to be one of the member churches, would we say yes or no? And the answer would be no. And for clear reasons. I mean, we, we either will... We'll, we'll be grieved. We feel there, there are matters of conscience that we would, uh, we would not be willing to, to, to accommodate because God's word is very clear on a number of things, whether it's, whether it's the way we do church. So the how, because your question is how, it makes it hard for me. The what seems to be clear to me the how would be a thing that the principles of God that are unchanging are brought to bear in those various situations. As, as a church, I would understand. Mm -hmm. What about you as a president? Okay. Me as a president. Wow, I've never thought of myself as a president. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I think, Victor, you, you're asking me to think from a perspective of a president who is a believer and the Constitution grants freedom of religion to everyone. Now, uh, I wonder if this would be a... I could try and think about that question, and maybe we interact over, over it even on the WhatsApp group, so that because it has a lot of ramifications, we, we need to think about theocracy versus uh, a situation of, of as we have right now. And there are people right now in the world who are saying that uh, we need to have a return. We need to have a return to you know, the, the law as it is in the Old Testament, so that there is stoning, capital punishment as it was. Uh, they feel that the, the, the civil law as it was in the Old Testament has not been abrogated. And uh, they've, they've caused quite some challenge in the Christian space. I think it's a thing we could, if, if you agree, we could have that discussion a bit more on the WhatsApp group. Mr. Murungi Nilion and Kamu Meleteo microphone. Okay, right. All right, okay. Um, in a minute. Uh, okay. Uh, my question was on uh, what you, you discussed mm -hmm. on the last part. How mm -hmm. do we know God? Uh, so uh, I felt like you were explaining uh, the holiness of God, his otherness, uh, his, how he's separated from us. Yes. His holiness. Yes. So, uh, is it that? That's what I'm asking. Is yes, I was talking about the incomprehensibility of God, his otherness, his otherness in a number of areas. The name of God is incomprehensible. You remember Jacob, uh, Genesis 32, 29, being asked, 
Why is it that you ask my name? Or Judges 13, 18, but the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it's wonderful? His name is incomprehensible. The nature of God himself is incomprehensible, not just his name, Job 11, 7. Can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? The nature of God himself is incomprehensible. Psalm 139.6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot attain to it. The works of God in creation are incomprehensible. Job 5.9, for example, who goes... Who does great and unsearchable things, wonders without number? Job 26, 14, behold, these are the fringes of his ways. You know, the things we see and we are flamexed. Those things that we see and uh, Joe's just drop, they are the fringes of his ways. And how faint a word we hear of him, but his mighty thunder, who can understand? His works in creation are incomprehensible. His works in judgment are incomprehensible. Psalm 90.11 would say, Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due to you? Even his work in redemption is incomprehensible. You remember Romans 11.33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. And then the invisibility of God is incomprehensible. John chapter 1 verse 18 would say, No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten who is in the bosom of the Father, has explained him. The holiness of God is incomprehensible. Exodus 15, 11. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? Even First Samuel 2, 2 would show the holiness of God is incomprehensible. There is no one holy like the Lord. Indeed, there is no one besides you. Nor is there any rock like you. And Isaiah 57, 15 would also say that. That God is incomparable means he is incomprehensible also. Isaiah 40, 18 would say, To whom will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? So there is divine incomprehensibility. And what I was saying is, as Christians, we are committed to both the incomprehensibility of God and the knowability of God. And if we are to know him, it's because he's told us who he is. Brother Mwirigi, can we accommodate you next Sunday? Okay, all right. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for starting us off on this very important subject. Please help us to, at our own private time, having realized this is important, kindly grant that everyone would in their own private time seek to search the scriptures, even before the class begins, because they are not doing it just because we are not doing this just to fill up time. We are doing it as people who realize this is of utmost importance. And so help me as I prepare and help my brothers and sisters as we go through the week to begin searching your word and asking ourselves, Oh God, what's the implication of your disclosure to us as Elkanah, as the God who is jealous? Please grant us wisdom and insight into your word. And out of this uh, time of study, kindly grant that those benefits we have said accrue to those who know their God would be made uh, our portion through the merits of your Son, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We please pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.